Hey guys, thanks for coming to hang out here on the sessions. A friendly reminder that you can hang out with me in more than one place because I'm also on AMP. Just download the app, come hang out with us Tuesdays and Thursdays, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Let's get a little more sessions in your life. We all need it. Guys, I am so beyond excited for this. George Strombolopoulos, the Strombo, joining me here on the sessions. Dare I say, I've never been this nervous oh, stop to it. do an oh, interview. No, but it's true. You are like without just blowing smoke up your ass to start the interview. You're like the go interviewer. So it's hard to prep for the guy that does the interview because I feel like maybe you're going to like cross analyze me or like, really, Ever. that's what you wanted to ask me? You know, well, you're very kind to say that. You're kind to say all those nice words off the top. Thank you. But the secret to a good interview is to be present and to listen and to actually care about the person you're sitting across from. And so I am in that same place being interviewed by you. So this will be lovely. Here we go. Where are you right now? What's going on in your world? I'm in Los Angeles right now. I do a daily show for Apple Music. So I'm, uh, I spend my mornings early having East Coast time zone meetings living in a west coast and then i uh i try to do as much as i can before i have to head to the studio and clear my brain and just go have fun and play music so that's uh, and do interviews so that's where i am right now la getting ready for uh for a new show did it take you a while to adjust to that like your internal clock being on east coast time to then going to pacific coast time and feeling like you were missing out on things during the day you've had to uh, accommodate for that yeah, luckily for me, I am always uh, running at the same pace. So I feel like people have to adjust to the fact that I don't need to slow down. You know, that's <laughs> one of the one of the great challenge. You know, your greatest strength is your greatest weakness in many respects, right? Yes. In life. Yes. Mine is definitely that my pace um, is relentless and has been relentless from when I first knew you. And my, like my pace has never stopped since I was I think I got into the workforce when I was 11 or 12 and I've been working at this pace pretty much the whole time. Wait, 11 to 12. What was your first job? I was, uh, I was, uh, I, I called it landscaping, but really all <laughs> I was doing was digging up weeds and <laughs> mowing lawns. And I was unloading, um, I was un unloading dump trucks with limestone and filling in ditches. Then I got a job driving a forklift at the airport in Toronto. Oh, airplane containers. I was a teenager then, uh, working at a movie theater at the same. I had two or three jobs pretty much from I think 14, 15 years old on. I've had more than more than two or three things on the go since that. And I'm that's 35 years ago. What's that about? What's with all the jobs? What is that hustle? What is the need to like stay so busy and like business oriented? I I love to make things. I love to create things and I love to to I I, I think I realized very early and maybe it's because the music I listened to and I grew up, you know, in the home of immigrants so I got, I'm I'm the first the person in my family I believe born in Canada and the I grew up realizing that the government, the police, the judges, the schools, the churches, none of these are on your side. It's it's you're always everything you ever get to will be either through luck and the grace of others or sheer as Gord Downey said, you know, will and determination and grace too, like that's it. So my whole life it was and no one told me that. I just saw it. I saw my mom, a single mom raising a family working her ass off and I'm like, man, if you want to do this, you got to go. So that's been my whole life. And now I just like to make things. I don't have a family. I don't have kids. I never wanted any of that stuff. So I'm just like, well, what can we go do today? That's exciting. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how I am. It's funny having that, like that kind of like go-getter attitude. Cause I feel like I was always the same. I mean, not, not, you know, I wasn't born uh, to, to immigrants in Canada. I didn't see like that side of it. But it, like I was same thing. Actually, one of my first jobs was working for a garden center. I was working like one of the old cash registers, like pruning the flowers. I always just wanted to work. And the same thing actually applied to like my broadcasting career where I was like, where can I go? What can I work in? And we can get into all that stuff in terms of like where to work in Canada and how limiting that can be in certain respects. But yeah, having that hustle all the time of like, what's next? Where can I go? It's it's a really funny like fire to have in your belly. How have you been able to maintain that for this long and to keep that work pace up? Do you want the real answer? The real yeah, answer? Give me the is, goods. Is to me it's not hustle, it's grind and they're different. And that hustle is often about getting something off somebody. 
grind is just about you and your experience and what you're doing. I've never, I've, I've always approached my life, my career. I worked the way I partied, which is, <laughs> which is a lot. I ride motorcycles the way I make shows, which is I am all in all the time. I don't negotiate with myself. I don't, I, I live in a world of like in my own head, I mean, of extreme accountability, uh -huh. but also don't, I don't really care about the end result. So for me, it was just the doing, doing, doing was the thing that I valued the most. And, and I, and I, maybe I feel like I listened, I was lucky enough to listen to good music and watch good movies and read good books when I was young so that my foundation was about what prepared me for this. So I never mm -hmm. really, when, when things go well, if I have a great career or I get fired from a job public, I don't care. Like, it's not about that. It's about the doing of it. So I've been prepared, I think, by the art that I've consumed over my life. Uh -huh. Sure. To be, to be able to keep going. And uh, and I don't really worry about any of the other stuff. It's grind, though, not hustle. Because grinding, you're creating space, I think, for other people, where hustle is often about taking things from people. I so like that's that. been my big shift. I like that a lot. Um, have you ever found yourself in precarious situations or uh it, i guess like having that lifestyle of being on the motorcycles working all the time like do you ever burn yourself out or fall into like injuries or need to like give yourself a little bit of a breather to to refill your cup i um i finished a uh, uh, one of my days i was doing the late night talk show but uh, we would record around 5 p.m. and i i think it was the first or second day of the new season and i got on my motorcycle i had a Jixer 750 uh, outside of wayne gretzky's in toronto and <laughs> i went too fast and i crashed and i broke my collarbone and i had a concussion and i ripped my oh, leg shit. and i was crumbled underneath my motorcycle and this gentleman who lived on the street called frosty said you better get out of here before the cops come now there was no reason for me to get out before the cops come because I wasn't doing anything wrong except for being stupid and <laughs> I don't know why I listened to him but he pulled my busted up shoulder pulled it out put me on my motorcycle and sent me away oh, so I my rode God. so I rode home and I realized very I knew right away I'm like I'm hurting I'm in trouble so I, I get myself to the hospital right I get Just myself a little to the jaunt hospital. over to St. Mike's not, it, that like, okay. not that far so I'm like, I'm not feeling good. I'm going to throw up. I have a concussion. I know it because I've had them before. And this is where I'm the wrong guy to listen to because I left the hospital. I got wheeled to the front door, right? I got out of the wheelchair. I got crutches and I went to work <laughs> and I did, and I did the show with a broken and I didn't take any painkillers, not even Tylenol or aspirin because I, I thought a, they would make me dopey on the air. Sure. B, I didn't want to get accustomed to painkillers because I like to do things. So I didn't want to get into painkiller life. I didn't want to go back to that part of my life. Uh, and also, I thought the accident was 100% my fault. And if I'm going to be stupid, I should pay for it. Oh, so I, my God. So, dude, I went on the air and I did the show the entire time while my bones healed. <laughs> and I ref so the answer to your question is no, but I don't actually think I did it the right way. I think that I suffer today from that choice. I feel like my brain rewired in how gangster I was about my career. <laughs> and I, I think given another opportunity, I would probably do it the same way, but I would hope that I wouldn't. Oh um, my gosh. Yeah. I don't ever let myself, um, I don't ever, I don't miss shows, which is dumb. Renee, I wish it wasn't like that. No, I but I like get that. that. Like, I get that. So, okay. Why do you not miss shows? Is that you feel like you're letting people down? Is it that grind? What is yeah. it? I just, I don't know. I feel, I A feel like. FOMO? No, definitely not that. I feel like my responsibility is to make the gig. And I know that, and I know that that is part of toxic workplace mentality i know that but i guess it's because i guess it's because i grew up in a world where if you didn't make the gig you didn't get paid you didn't feed your family sure. and so my thing with now i know that i've passed beyond that stage of my life 
but it's just my old school wiring and conditioning. So now I'm very, now I'm much different. I still work like this. I work through being sick, but, and I work through being hurt. I've had multiple motorcycle accidents and made the gig. There was a time at Much Music where I was on the air and what people couldn't see when I was doing Much News, th there I was on the air and what people couldn't see was behind me, the producer, Catherine, had her hand on my back holding me up because I couldn't use my left leg. And so she was holding me up and no one would know because we shot, you know, just framing me. So I made the gig. Um, so I, I just always came from that mentality. And now what I do is if I feel like something is not right, I make sure that I prioritize what needs to be done. Well, I can't shirk this responsibility, but what I can do is cut everything else out of my day to heal. Okay. So I'm very specific about um, what needs to be done versus what I want to do. Okay. And so I, I don't care about what I want. I only care about what I need in that moment. So I will, I will absolutely, I've changed my whole life in, in that respect where I'm like, okay, I have to make the show, but I'm not feeling hundred percent or my back is broken or something. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend 16 hours in recovery and I'm going to spend three hours doing the gig. So I'm very, I'm very smart about that now. So I'm better than I used to be. But I acknowledge that how my conditioning created a scenario and then my choices perpetuated a scenario that's not good for people. Like I always tell people, don't do it like I do it. I'm just like, I'm I'm a Gen X kid who is who you 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 fight for everything you have. So I know that that's not good, but that's just how I've been my whole life. Okay, so I may be going into a different territory here, but because you are hardwired that way, you work, you work, you work. That is the priority. You mentioned that you you don't have a family. It wasn't something that you wanted. Do those things go together? Did you purposefully not make room for those things because you have worked at the pace that you have? Yes, it was very intentional. It was very intentional. I don't I think I don't think you can have it all. Right. I think you can have a lot of it, not at the same time. Um, I think that to do what I did for a living the way I wanted to do it, which was remain true to myself, like remain true for better or for worse. Um, it meant I didn't want to have to make choices based on any other input than what is the most truthful way I can be. And I found that I remember talking to Mark Messier, uh, you know, this is just after he retired and he got married. And I said to him, it's interesting that you got married now. And he said, yeah, because when I was the captain of the team, had I had a family, they wouldn't believe that winning was the most important thing in my life. And winning Gosh. was the most. And he said, he said that now I understand that that kind of comment creates a whole bunch of responses in a comment section and everybody thinks what's right or wrong. But the, the fact is only you really know what works best for you. Sure. Right? And Mark knew that this was his focus. I'm, I'm not Mark Messier by any means. So I'm not that good, but I absolutely set out to, to do this thing the way I wanted to do it, the way I heard Joe Strummer do it or George Carlin do it or Chuck D do it or Ice T do it where you kind of, these are the people I grew up really liking as a mm -hmm. 14 year old, 15 year old and the way Patti Smith did it. And I thought, now they had families, some of them, but for my life, I'm like, no, I'm all in on this kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I made a choice like a long time ago. Some of the people would always say, oh, you'll meet the right person. I'm like, no, I've met the right person. I was the wrong person. For Pat, that is, is there one person that you no. think was your right person? No, no, no. I've been I've been so privileged to have dated some of the most amazing women with the most amazing minds, the mm -hmm. most amazing hearts. I've been so, so grateful. I be, I'm the man that I am today because of these beautiful relationships I've had raised by my mother and my sister, and my grandmother. Like I've, I've been around some really beautiful brains and hearts yeah. and they they've been instrumental in raising me into the, the, the man that I became. And and so they were all great. It was, I was the issue. I was the issue. <laughs> no, but it is, you know, it's an interesting point though. Cause I mean, you know, being married, having a daughter now, and 
I wasn't that girl that was always like, oh, I can't wait to get married. I can't wait to have kids, da, 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 like those things lined up and it happened for me and it's the best. But I see it even in like my husband who has always been a bit of like a lone wolf in his career. He's always done his own thing. Professional wrestling has always been his deal. And it's, uh, I have to remind myself of those things as well in terms of like creating space for the things that he needs to do to stay on track, to stay focused, to do the things he does. And I'm like, we've got- these things to do and our kid needs this and sometimes yeah you just need to like keep those dreams in the forefront you have to i i think you we have this fire in us that has to be stoked right and if you don't stoke it and maintain it that fire either burn dies out or gets out of control and torches everything around it yeah and i i recognized in me at a young age that i have this i have this fire that burns and that's as bad as it is good. <laughs> and so I had to maintain it and I had to protect it. And I realized that I wasn't going to, the, to be a great father uh, would mean I couldn't create movies or stories the way that I want to. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I have to make a choice. Plus, I I just looked around and went, well, I just do what feels right. And I've never felt the need for it, like never, never since I was a kid and never, never really, you know, never felt like I'm, I'm grateful other people have them because kids are awesome. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. It's nice uh, to hand them back, take them back. Let me get back to what I'm doing. (laughs) I I have no idea how you do that. And this, like, I have no idea how, because the thing that I don't. It makes your head spin. It does make your head spin for sure. Sleep, Like sleep. I, I, my relationship with sleep is so tenuous at best that to give up another two hours because something needs, fuck that. (laughs) I'm not you know doing what? That. It's not really the sleep for me because I can function pretty well on a minimal amount of sleep. It's more so keeping those creative juices flowing. Yeah. What's next? What's this other thing? Can I make this meeting? Can I get to this part of town? Um, it's yeah, it's kind of making space for that creativity to still be able to like flow through you. And I'm still kind of juggling that. Luckily, I'm I have jobs and I'm busy and that keeps me focused with all those things. But yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh God, yeah. give me a I- little. Because time can fly by, right? I, oh, I can it. Human beings also are the only animal that I'm aware of that can reinvent their experience. Mm-hmm. They're the only animal that can can decide it's going to be something else. As great as spiders are, and they are, I've never met one that started a band. <laughs> Not I've never, that we know of. Not that we know of, unless you talk about David Bowie and Spiders from our side. <laughs> the, but this idea that one of the, I think, the true jewels of the human experience is within your a version of biology, you can kind of do a lot of different things. So I think hope is a monumental, a monumental North Star to follow. Yeah. Yeah. And hope is not a plan, but it is important. And you have to be able to push yourself to do these things. Now, some people don't. Some people actually, their whole thing is they want to build a community with a family and do that. And that's great. Like, I think you have to know what your version is. And where I think people get themselves into trouble in their lives is when the gulf between who they want to be and who they are is too wide. I heard somebody say that. Oh, God, that's yeah. like, that's opening a can of worms right there. I heard somebody say Ooh. once. That the the gulf that like the size the distance between who you are and who you want to be is the size of your unhappiness. So, and that really smoked me. I went, wow, wow, dude. That's something to like sit and you have like a glass of wine and sit and think about that one. Oh yeah. lord, wow. Okay, I want to go back to something that you were talking about uh, earlier in terms of growing up. You're growing up in Canada. Um, you're you're working. You're grinding away. You're figuring things out. But you were consuming all this art, the literature, the music, et cetera, et cetera. And that really put you on course to be who you are today, to lay the foundation for all of the things that you brought to us, to me. Um, you really were the guy that told us what was cool, what we should know about. What were like the first things that really that really stuck to you in terms of like the literature and the art that you were consuming that really made you want to hone in on all this? Um, It was all the scary stuff, right? It was all the edgy stuff that I would have been too young 
to have seen or should have seen, like seeing Night of the Living Dead when I was five or six years old, same age when I saw The Exorcist, same age when I heard Alice Cooper. A couple of years later, I heard The Misfits. Um, and the the rise of Slayer and Metallica, the beginnings of Public Enemy, all the stuff that was in the margins of the conversation were the things that I was naturally drawn to. It's why, it's why you know, Renee, I don't know how much free will we actually have because I don't know why I chose all that stuff. I don't know why that stuff, my, mom, my mother said to me, it was like the lights went out of my eyes. You just were drawn to all this really dark thing, dark, dark art, but I don't know why that happened. But so what that did was, I think, and I'm grateful that I was drawn to that stuff because what it did was teach me uh, to be comfortable in being an outsider. Mm -hmm. It taught me to be comfortable with questioning, not just the the answers, but questioning the questions that you get. And I learned that when I was 12 years old, I was working at a Mr. Submarine by the airport making sandwiches. Hell yeah, love him. You know what? I love a Mr. Sub. Subway's yep. fine. Mr. Sub, great uh Milkshake it's as well. it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to explain to people just how amazing it was when you had your first assorted <laughs> and like pe most people around the world don't know what an assorted is but when you have an assorted a cool cut trio you mean yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. and I remember walking in with uh with um with my a Walkman that I had on listening to a cassette with those foamy ear earplugs earphones and this guy said to me what are you listening to and I think I was listening to I don't know if it was the Misfits or something or I don't know and he said why do you like punk rock and I said you got to question the the answers and he goes no nah, man fuck that question the questions mm. i'm 12 years old when i hear the 14 and ding 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 totally totally it 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 blew my mind when when you realized that there was a different experience out here you didn't have to live way so all that art so i started but you know i started reading stephen king and uh, and stephen king of course was really big and i started reading sherlock holmes and then i started reading anton lavey i read alistair crowley because i heard about it in you know black sabbath or ozzy osbourne tunes so music was my connection to all this stuff and then i had my uncle who's still alive paul is maybe the biggest uh, uncle paul's the biggest cultural force in my life he when i was 10 or 11 or 12 would take me to see independent movies in Toronto at these movie theaters that weren't playing the big blockbusters. So I would watch really, really what would now be called age inappropriate stuff. <laughs> but what he did was let me watch them and then talked about them to me. So he taught me how to think critically. Mm -hmm. And that became, that became my driving force, right? Which is, I don't just want what everybody likes because it doesn't speak to me. It felt manufactured. I wanted something that was a little bit more, you know, in the darker alleys of the neighborhood you grew up in, that kind of thing. And so <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that, so that was it. Music was really important. Like the Clash, the Sex Pistols, directly to answer your question, were really George Carlin were really, really important to me in terms of fighting a system that everybody told you you had to respect. Okay. And I think that's what it so you're listening to all the, 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 you mentioned, you know, you rattle off some of the musicians and the, the films and whatnot you were seeing, you mentioned George Carlin. Why was it broadcasting that that was the avenue that you chose to, to have that be your art? It was weird is that it wasn't, it's not the plan. I wasn't supposed to do this for a living and I don't know how it happened. Like I, <laughs> I, this was not my goal. I loved radio and I, but I didn't think you could be on the radio. I didn't think that that's how it worked. How, like you don't, just don't get a job in radio. So I was working at this movie theater in Rexdale, seeing lots of movies. I kind of figured, I was like, maybe I'll be a, an a architect. I love design. Maybe I'll be a designer of some kind. I like to draw. Maybe I'll be a, an, I don't know, maybe I'll be a director, you know, films. I thought that stuff. But again, I didn't know anybody in any of these fields. I didn't see any pathways to any of it. And I wasn't the kind of guy, I mean, I think I'm inherently lazy where I wasn't going I to- like to differ you on that one. But I mean, I'm inherently lazy in this way. If I don't really want to do it, I'm just not going to do it. Okay. <laughs> you know? okay. So, so I, I, I kind of, I was just working at this movie theater going, ah, for whatever. I joined the militia, the, 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 the reserves in the army on the dare. I'm like, maybe I'll do that. I don't know. And, but I was working at this theater. And so I went to get a motorcycle license as a teenager because I love motorcycles and motorcycles to me were the, the equal liberation. So adult learning center which had an office right beside the movie theater i was an usher in so i could pay for my course my motorcycle course because it was in the parking lot of humber college that's where they did the test back then 
great. And the woman who worked there was a girl who I had a crush on. And I think, you know, I was too edgy for her, but she kind of was maybe. She wanted to tip her toe a little bit. She wanted to see what was up with the danger. I think so. But (laughs) nothing ever happened. It was just friendly, but he could sell that she was more interested in my well-being than I was and she which you know that I've never said that out loud but I actually think that's what it was I think this girl saw something in me that I didn't and she said here take a look at this where, where the motorcycle thing was and she said there's a course calendar here for other projects so I flipped through it and I saw radio and I went ah fuck it I'll try that that's it dude that's my whole career and I, I applied to one college, Humber, really, for one program. I had my meeting with Humber College was 12 seconds, 15, 20 seconds long. I certainly did not wow them. They did not wow me. And I left with no interest. And then I got a letter in the mail saying, you're coming to Humber for radio. And I went, oh, okay. Shit, okay. And you know what? It was, uh, I think tuition at the time was $900 plus another 400 for books and materials and radio, like you have to buy Great. tapes. So it was a $1,300 experience. I worked at the movie theater and I drove a forklift and I worked at Mr. Submarine and I paid, uh, actually by this point I went to Subway and I paid for my college and I didn't get a grant from the government. Eventually they gave me a loan year too, but I didn't want the loan because I didn't want student debt. The loan was like two grand. So I put it in the <laughs> bank and I had it mature on the day I had to pay it back. And I just paid my <laughs> all the money back. And I think I made like three hundred dollars of yeah. interest that I used to pay for my motorcycle insurance. <laughs> <laughs> you had the <laughs> system all sorted out. I did, yeah. That's did. really funny. I remember I so I went and applied to Seneca for their broadcasting because I didn't know where to go either or what to do or how to get my foot in the door. I didn't really know what I was doing. But I remember going to my meeting at Seneca and I was with like, you know, you do like the orientation with like, you know, 10 or 12 people and everyone's like, I work in audio and I do video production. I do whatever. And this asshole, I go, I just want to be on TV. They fucking scoffed at me like, get (laughs) out of here. I still have embarrassment over like everyone turned around was like, calm down. Anyways, I didn't get in. But it it worked for you. (laughs) It did work. It worked for you. But I, I have secondhand embarrassment from myself. So firsthand embarrassment. The thing I didn't um, realize, the thing I didn't realize back then, but it is actually true, is you I don't believe in manifestation, but I do believe in feeding your subconscious with the things and the ideas you want. Yeah. And if you do that enough, you have a better shot at getting them than otherwise. It's not a guarantee, but you knew what you wanted and you found a way to do it. And I yeah. think that there's something really impressive about that because there are a million roadblocks in every human being unless you're ultra wealthy unless you're that person but even then you have roadblocks sure there it's just fucking hard to do this life and it's hard to get close to your dreams you're dealing with your parents conditioning if you have them your your guardians you're dealing with a system you're dealing with all these things that kind of don't want you to win they just want you to be safe yes and safe isn't the same thing as winning and for me, I thought I need to be in the danger places because that's because I can win there. Yeah. And that's my entire career was about putting myself in dangerous places and, and putting myself in dangerous places in my mind, which is now, nah, bro, go fucking get it. Yes. Go get it. Risk, 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 risk. Most uh, people couldn't do that, but it was it worked for me. You have to know your brain. No, absolutely. Having that risk and feeling that little bit of like that danger, knowing that you're pushing yourself that like having that safety, having that safety net alone. So I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to have that thing to fall back on. It's like, no, fucking figure it out. Go do it. Okay. You much music, staying true to yourself. You were that guy for everybody. Like I said, you really told us what was cool. You were that that outsider guy at Much Music. Talk to me about what that experience was like for you. Kind of because you are that guy that's very true to himself. There's such an authenticity with what you do. There's nothing contrived about what you're doing. Um, but with your experience at Much Music, how much how much freedom did they give you to work on those on those shows, come up with those programs and just be you? I feel, um, I feel like, you know, Renee, my time at Much Music, I feel like I was gifted the greatest five years you could have in a career. I 
that place was so amazing to work at. It was like, it was a place. It wasn't perfect, but, and there were lots of challenges for sure. But the, it was the people who worked there, certainly when I got there, it changed a little bit as time went on. But when I first got there, the on-air people, the hosts, the producers, the management, everybody loved the culture. They, and they and they valued the culture. They valued the relationship you have with the audience. We didn't have the biggest ratings, but what we knew was we had the biggest impact. Yeah. We knew that you could look at all the ratings of all the cable channels in Canada, and much music was generally pretty low, but I would walk down the street with people from other networks and they didn't know who they were but they knew who we were. When I would go, when I would travel with Rick Campanelli, like it was people talk to us about music and culture. Like we yeah. were, in, I felt so lucky to be a part of, but I never planned on it. I didn't want to be on my, I didn't have much music as a kid, right? I didn't have cable. So I was working in radio doing a show. Did you, I'll talk about that later, but I was working <laughs> on a show in radio, which I think is where I met. And I got a call one day saying, do you want to go talk to him about working at much music? And I was like, eh. I don't really like most pop music. I don't want to, that's not my thing. I would do it for the money because I was broke. But I I, I think I was making $14,000 a year at, at the edge, living Hell on yeah. a, I had a futon frame, a wood frame without a mattress. I had the frame and a sheet over the frame. And that's what I, that was my bed that I found in the garbage. Like that's I was so broke living in Toronto back then. And you're bro anyone's broke living in Toronto yeah, now. Shit. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, and so they said, no, it's to host the new music. And that's a show that I had watched because it was airing on city TV at the time. So, and you didn't need cable for that. And that's a big reason why I liked a lot of the bands I liked was the new music. So I went to meet with them and honestly, it was an average meeting. It was fine. There was nothing to it. Um, they didn't call me back. I didn't pursue it with them, uh, but I met with the producer. What happened was a few months later, I'm, working at a radio station at the edge doing that night show and i what i did was when i got there there were these poles and ropes that the hosts would have up to keep people off the street away from you every time i went to work i would take those poles down and everybody would come into the studio and come sit with me at the desk let's hang around and you could tell that some of these kids were experiencing homelessness some of these kids had homes but didn't want to go home and we were creating this really safe space community center for them and talking about music and i was also like fucking 24 years old 25 yeah. i was a kid too right yeah and, and uh and there was some dude hanging around for a couple hours and at the very end he said so i run much music do you want this or not and i was like what so he brought me in to meet with denise donlin and who's running it at the time, she was his boss. And she said, so why do you want to work? Why do you want to be a VJ? And I said to her, I don't think that I do. Like, it's not, she wrote about it in her book, actually, thankfully corroborating my memory. So I remembered it correctly, but <laughs> she's like, I don't, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here for music and culture. And I'm here for kids who are at home with single moms who are, have, I'm, I'm here to show kids that there's a way out. There's a way out. And essentially, and then they gave me the job and that's kind of what happened. So it was never part of the plan, but I, I have stayed true to my values for most of my career. And when I haven't, it backfires, right? Um, when sometimes haven't you, what are the instances that you haven't? Oh, dude, I, I, I <laughs> stayed true to my values when I took the hockey night in Canada game, but I knew that they were never going to let me live my values. So, so it blew what up. happened there? Because. Being a Canadian, being on Hockey Night in Canada, of course, was a dream, but mm -hmm. you were kind of walking into a bit of a sticky situation to begin with. Um, yeah. What was that experience like for you to go from, ho you know, God, you've interviewed the who's who, everybody from David Bowie, Mick Jagger, Dolly Parton, fucking Kermit and Miss Piggy, like you've interviewed everybody, to then being on Hockey Night in Canada and covering a sport and making yeah. that transition can be pretty difficult, not so much as a broadcaster, but in terms right. of reception. But I started in sports. That's what's crazy, right? Is that early in my career, I was a, I was an NBA reporter at the fan. So I actually was on the fan for years doing, and I was a sports reporter and hosting sports shows. So, so sports to me wasn't new by any means. What was different was that I didn't like the way sports broadcasting was done generally. I thought it was exclusive. I thought it was inherently biased, misogynist, racist, homophobic, transphobic, and I, I thought that because I worked in places where I saw it all the time. Mm -hmm. I saw it all the nothing compared to what you would have experienced because, but I, but I saw it because I was in the boys club. I was a fucking, you know, as a dude working with a bunch of dudes. So I saw shit and it, 
was kind of awful. And so when I, I, I left it and went to uh, do my rest of my career, when hockey approached me, I remember saying to them, you don't want this. You don't want me. Like, trust me. You're doing what this was because- like the initial idea? Were they just like everyone loves Strombo, everyone trusts Strombo? Let's bring him in. I He's think the what happened voice. was I think what happened was in the NHL, they saw what I was doing with my talk show, and they saw that on the talk show that we had lots of different people from different walks of life watching us. Different they they they, they what I was told directly was we want to make it more open and progressive. Mm-hmm. I think the, I remember the heads of Rogers, the guy that ended up trying to get fire me said to me when I was the host, the ratings went up with people under 30 and with women. I was doing my job. I right. was doing what I was supposed to do because I was being more inclusive and all that stuff. But what happened was the guy who hired me left. So he left me to a bunch of people who would never have hired me in the first place right. um, because they were far more concerned. I'll, I'll tell you what, there was times where a producer would say, your socks are getting a lot of attention on Twitter. We don't want people to tweet about the socks. What you should wear socks more. For these? Right. They said this to a bunch of the hosts. You shouldn't be wearing that. You should just be talking about the game. And I remember saying to them, you guys are guys. You don't understand Canada. Like you're, you're, you only understand the audience you currently have. And I'm telling you that if you want to make this more inclusive and grow, you will shed some of the closed minded people off the top. But yeah. you'll get them back when you get their families back and you're more inclusive. And I said, it actually matters. Like, I'm like, I'm the edgiest guy here. How am I the voice of reason? <laughs> right? Like, I'm the, how, but, I'll, but, but, um, so there was a lot of that. And I remember speaking of interviews, I remember doing an interview and I got some, some stuff out of the person and the team freaked out, called hockey and made them pull the interview so that, so then I realized all oh, the broadcasters work for the teams. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you know what? You guys don't actually want this. So we orchestrated the exit, which is very, it worked out beautifully for me. And when it was over, I was relieved, to be honest with you. Great. Um, And it was, um, but I took the job knowing it wasn't going to work. I took the job knowing it was, I I had actually turned down working with members of that team earlier. I got offered a job in the Olympics and I heard a lot of really bad, and I turned the Olympics down, which I probably shouldn't have, but I did for two reasons. One, because it, it, it was in China. It was very on my daily show I was talking a lot about human rights so i was like you know ethically i can't do it but also i heard some pretty n- n- shifty things about some of the team mm-hmm. couple people only yeah and i just thought i don't want to be a part of this i ended up working with them on hockey night and i was like oh my instincts were there right. it is yeah you know? yeah and the majority of the people at hockey night were amazing amazing and they um, and they make a great show i have no knock on hockey night in canada but I knew they didn't want to do what they said they wanted to do. I just knew it. Sure. Um, but I gave it the old college try anyway. Was and, there at uh, least a little part of you that had that like, ooh, risk, danger, pushing yourself into that? Okay, we're going to see what's up in this territory. Was there a little bit of that firing off? Yeah, totally. I thought, this is going to blow up. I know it's going to blow up. So if I don't do it, it's what am I? Is it because I'm afraid it's going to blow up? Sure. Fuck fear. Right. Yeah. Let it Fuck fly. Me. Yeah. Let it fly. Well, I knew it wasn't. Good. So I made sure with my team said, just negotiate a guaranteed contract because it's not going to work. It's not going to last, but I wanted it to, I wanted it to, I still would like, I, I would do it. Like they did it. What they were trying to do. They weren't all in. And it's a good life lesson. They dipped their toes, but didn't understand that to actually win. What they did was with me was they brought in a kind of player and then they didn't, play the right system they played the wrong system right and if you bring in a certain kind of player you got to play a system for that person yeah um, and we could have made something pretty special but they got what they wanted very conservative like let's not worry about you know that that's what they wanted and only a couple of people wanted progress but the guy who brought me in left and when he did that i knew it was over. like i knew it was over <laughs> one he year bro one year he fucking give me left. one year come on totally so I knew uh, it was fantastic but, yeah, i think um, it's really, i think it's really important to do shit just to do it you know sure so, yeah and i also what it did was it actually extended my career because by this point i'd been on the tv a long time i've been on radio a long time and you become just something that people accept like oh yeah it's our guy you know it's cool it's whatever um when that blew up I think the Globe and Mail or somebody wrote a piece about it and they tried to reach me for comment. I didn't respond because I didn't care. 
Uh, and I think the quote, quote was George can't be reached because he's currently riding his motorcycle across the U.S., which right. was true. OK. <laughs> and and so what it did was it made me the young edgy guy again in a weird way. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's that's great. Yeah. Put you like back yeah. in that spot. Yeah. Kind of fired yeah, that I, back up. Even though I wasn't young, but I was definitely the guy that stuck true to his values. And I think yeah. that's important. And then, you know, in the when when sports media got quite rightly lambasted for their handling of actual events happening in the world. Yeah. Um, I was like, yeah, guess what you guys wanted? Yeah. You want, and I just didn't, but it wasn't like the hockey night guys were great. Like I said, I just had a couple of people where I thought, yeah, this is not, you guys don't want this to be, take a look at, I shouldn't say this, but the way women were represented on TV and sports at the time, and still are not on air as hosts Mm -hmm. because there's amazing people, but just looked at some of the imagery being used and language being used. And you could hear that shit. Now I wouldn't have known that at 22, but I was lucky enough to work at Much Music and work at CBC with amazing people who taught me, here's where your bias is appearing. Here's where your language is exclusive rather than inclusive. Today, people attack that as being politically correct, but it's not politically correct. It's actually about being honest and open and know who represents the country. Don't just represent a bunch of fucking small, close-minded people. Like, Remember that everybody's opinion or everybody's presence is welcome here. So I was, I was, I learned from amazing people how to be the kind of broadcaster that stitched a country together. I used to say this about CBC all the time. I remember telling people that we're the, we're the emotional and intellectual railroad of the country. Like we're not the country. The country is the country and the country always changes. But at our best, we should be the people that move these ideas and connections and resources towards all of us. And I felt, and I'm, Thought that's what hockey should do. I think hockey should do it now, and it's not what they do. It became a little bit broy again, and I, I love. I watch the Habs every game. I watch motorcycle racing every week when it's on. I, that's my other favorite sport. I love watching basketball. I love sports, but I mostly don't watch the broadcasting part of it anymore yeah. because I feel like it's like oh, I've I listened to some people having a conversation on sports radio in the U.S. about trans athletes and i thought i have never heard a less equipped group of people to have this discussion in my life yeah it was shocking it was shocking how it was shocking to me (laughs) no it's true you can you can hear some fucking outlandish shit sometimes if you just keep your ears open and you understand like where people come from what their mindsets are even yeah i mean when you look at people that are high up in networks and stuff and it's like it can be jaw dropping because people are scared to step out they are afraid to have change they're afraid to lose viewership they're afraid of all of those things um and that is a thing that's been really hard to like legitimately evoke totally. change totally do you remember the, the the wrestling show live audio wrestling yeah yeah do you remember? You, you wouldn't might not know this. Did you? It used to be called Slam, and that I was one of the creators of it. What? Yeah, me and Jeff Merrick and Bob Mackwoods Jr. We created that show for the first internet radio station in Canada in the '90s. Before I worked at the Edge, long before I worked that much, it was called Slam, and we <laughs> created the show. But I realized very quickly, like I loved wrestling as a kid, but I realized that as wrestling was changing, I wasn't I wasn't connected to it. Sure. So I walked away from it and and Donnie came in and, 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 and Dan came in and it became something with Jeff became something else. They changed it to live audio wrestling and it became a whole other project. But it's it's genesis was slam on an internet radio station. And I was one of the creators of it. That is so f- who were like your wrestling guys? What were you into? Well, I was into remember, I'm old, right? So I, I was into Maple Leaf wrestling. I would go on Saturdays to watch. Yeah you know, uh, uh, Jimmy Superfly and mm-hmm. I would watch the early Hulk, but I was into heels. I only liked heels. I remember my first wrestling match. I had my uncle got courtside, like ringside seats. It was a, a cage match with big John stud and Ken Patera against, Hell yeah. the, against junkyard dog and Andre the giant. That was like, <laughs> I was like four. Like, so that was my era of watching wrestling. It's great. Well, we got to get you back out because I feel like, you know what, even some of the things that we're saying, I feel like wrestling actually does a very good job in terms of being progressive and inclusive. I think wrestling does a, a pretty good job with all of those things. Wrestling had women competing at a high level. Yeah. And I think people might not outside of wrestling might not understand just how important Trish Stratus is. Oh my God, legend, legend. legendary. 
And I met Trish, I think when we were both, I was like 20. She wasn't in wrestling at all. We were just kids. We met at some event. Um, I had done a pilot TV show. I was trying to make a sports music pilot show where I met Rocky Maivia before he was The Rock. Oh my gosh. You know, and Sweet Daddy Siki and all that. We were all around. And um, and Trish was as nice then as she was when she was super famous. But wrestling gave a place where women got in the ring and slayed on the same cards yes. as men. Yes. And that's fucking important, man. So when I you have look at Trish, like what Trish was able to do with Lita to be the first women to like main event Monday Night Raw to see what they were doing at pay-per-views to be like really key players in the factions that they were working with. Like those women really laid the groundwork for what we yep. see in wrestling today. And there's, you know, there's women ahead of them as well that that helped to to lay the foundation for them too. But Fabulous honestly, Moolah. I used to watch Fab- the Fabulous yes. Moolah wrestle. Yeah. Yes. Medusa. I mean, there's so many women that you kind of rattle yeah. off that have just been able to to make wrestling such a cool space. And I'm happy that I was able to contribute in any small way to what we see with women. You certainly and, were. Uh, when I when I saw you on there, I'm like, I'm like, I know her. Wait a second. Like I knew her when she was <laughs> like a kid I yeah. know her you know? and then your dad told me that it's like it's her I'm like oh my god yeah. <laughs> didn't see that one coming but kind of going back to what you said I didn't know I was gonna end up in wrestling I was just kind of saying yes to opportunities that came my way in yeah. figuring it out finding yeah. a way to be like how can I do this how can I make this work for me and that's you know now I have a career in professional wrestling that I never would have seen and in broadcasting in a way that I never would have seen. Um, and how amazing is it, by the way, when, cause I get the reports, I look at ratings all the time and wrestling kills. People love it. People love wrestling. It kills. I know. I'm so I love that it kills. I love the range of storylines it's had. I've, I've gotten to know Sami Zayn cause I, you know, he's uh, serious. And is been, he not the best? I was so happy when I saw that you had him on your show and some of you guys got to, he's one of my favorite human beings. We I didn't I I Sammy and I kind of connected on social media only because we both love the same punk rock band from Winnipeg, Propagandy. <laughs> okay. And I I just it didn't occur to me. I hadn't been keeping up on who was wrestling or doing what. And I saw I looked at this guy who followed me on social media. I'm like, why does this guy with all these followers follow me? I looked at him and went, Oh, that's Sammy Zane. I've heard of him. I'm like, oh bro, he loves propaganda. I'm down. He's so, legit. He's, he's legit. a legit dude. He's and so he's Syrian. Cool. He was speaking out about Syria. I went yeah. to Syria, so we really bonded on it. And and I love uh, I love what Sammy does, and I love who Sammy and I love his crazy conspiracy shit because because I know his actual values are so good. And in a world where the conspiracy shit is like super weird, and he feeds it but also pulls back, I just love how right on the fucking edge of the blade <laughs> there he is. <laughs> best when i was pregnant he actually hosted one of my uh one of my maternity leave episodes and yeah anytime i've had sammy on the show like the stuff that flies out of his mouth he's the absolute best um okay before i let you go i know we're kind of running short on time but i just really wanted to talk to you about fine, by the way i'll talk to you for as long as you want <laughs> great we're gonna keep <laughs> on hanging then um when you were doing the hour and doing uh doing uh strombo tonight doing all these shows within canada how were those opportunities were they brought to you? Were they shows that you had pitched? Like, how did you do that? Because for people that are listening that don't understand, there's like a handful of people in Canada that have been able to have their own shows as successful as yours were in the time slots that they were. Like, how the hell did you pull that off? Yeah, we had a nightly talk show for a decade. That, Crazy. That hasn't happened. Yeah. You know what it was? I was working at Much Music at the time and I had, um, CBC had reached out to me to host a show and I went to meet them. And I got a bad vibe. Mm. I got a bad vibe. And I said, nah, I'm going to pass. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, they asked me to host a, an arts and culture show. And I had said to them, I currently host the new music, which I think is the best arts and culture show. But CBC has a very particular way of doing things. And in the yeah. meeting, I just went, you yeah, know, so I turned them down. And uh, I, I wouldn't even like I just wouldn't do it. Then I got offered another show at CBC which wasn't the right show for me. But the person who offered it to me was a very old school news producer, a conservative kind of producer, not a conservative, but conservative in, in her approach. But she, her and I just, she was a, a bit older than me, but we just kind of bonded. I liked her. She said, I don't think this is the right show for you, but would you come over here and host a news show? And I said, no, no, I, I, I'm, it was a, a six o'clock news show. And I was like, no, it's not the right fit. But, and she understood that. 
but I just kind of dug her, you know, and yeah. I'm like, this woman, she's cool. She's older than me. She's like cool. But we, I just like, I like her. I like who she is. Then when I was working on much music, I got offered to host uh, the greatest Canadian. I got offered to pick uh, somebody for the greatest Canadian. Canada was doing a series. And I said, I wanted to represent Tommy Douglas. And they said, well, how do you know Tommy Douglas is in, in even in the top 10? And I said, if he's not, I wouldn't want to be a part of it. Um, so they said you can do it, but I was still under contract to much music. So CBC was going to pay like no money for that. It was a lot for me at the time. I don't know if it was like 20 grand or 30 grand. It was a lot. But, you know, I remember going to much music and I said, hey, they want me to host this thing. I still work here. It's not getting in the way of this, but I would be me from much music representing Tommy Douglas. And much music said, yeah, you can do it, but you got to give us the money they're giving you. What? What? And I, yeah. And I said, what? Now I had just got a manager and an agent in the US at this point. Okay. And I called my manager and agent and they they were flabbergasted. They'd never even heard of that. But much music said, no, you're we're gonna take the money. That's our way of letting you do it. And I said, fuck you guys. Cool. So you can have the money. I'm gonna do it. Cause I knew that I was gonna go in there. And I knew who was producing and directing my episode, the late great guy of Sullivan. And I knew that we were gonna we were gonna fucking win. I knew because in my head I'm like, okay, you want to do this to me? This is the old street kid in me, right? That fuck you guy. Let's fucking go, yeah. yeah. So I put a smile on. Great, no problem, guys, no problem. And inside I'm like, fuck you guys. <laughs> so I went and did it. And I guess the the footage from the first week of shooting got back to CBC because I got a call saying, hey, they want to talk to you about doing a, a show with them. And I had already turned them down twice. And uh, I was like, all right, let me just keep going. Then I got booked to do, I was a guest on Peter Manfridge's one-on-one -on -one show talking about music and politics. Mm -hmm. So I did a thing about that. Uh, and then they're like, yeah, we, we want to give this guy a show. So they offered me a show, and th but they didn't know what it was. And I turned them down again. They said, we want to do this kind of show. We don't know what we're going to do. And I said, no, 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 no. It's not for me. I don't want to. Why did like, you why? think it wasn't for you? Well, kind of like my instinct with Hawking in Canada, I was like, you don't really want this. Mm. Like, I have a nose ring. I have, I wear black t-shirts and studded belts and I talk politics and music and culture and I'll interview wrestlers and I'll do like all this stuff. And I'm not, you don't want that. Cause I remember, remember they called it arts. Right. I didn't call it arts. I called it movies. Right. Yeah. So, so like, yeah. now, now I get it. But back then I was a little closed and I didn't believe them. So I was, I had met with them a couple of times and I had said to my manager, you know what, just turn it down. I don't want to do it. Uh, I don't believe in it. And he's like, yeah, I don't think they're going to let you do your thing. Anyway. They're good. Your thing anyway. So uh, he called me one day and he said, it's weird, but they're not accepting your no. They want to meet with you. They want to meet with you one more time. And I said, I don't really want to. And they said, just meet with them one more time because they're nice people and they wouldn't take your money from you the way much music did. And Step he, in the I, right direction. Yeah. And he said, you're, I said, you're right. So I walked down the street. I did a much news hit. Walked the street, met with CBC. In the middle of that meeting, I went, eh, maybe. But I didn't say anything. I walked back. I did the rest of my shift. That week, I was supposed to fly to uh, Darfur. The genocide was happening in Darfur, the war. I was going with Rain Maida from Our Lady Peace. We were just going as friends to, to see what we can do. We weren't really affiliated. Our friend Eric from War Child was coming with us, but it was we were on a different mission. And I'm sitting on the plane with, with Rain from Our Lady Peace. And I said to him, hey, what do you think of this? CBC has offered me this show. And he said, what's the show? And, and it would be a nightly news talk show. It would start on News World. And who knows, maybe I could bring it on the main network one day. And he said to me, it'll never work. He said, and I'm, we're sitting across like a seat across the aisle on a plane. So we're just talking, right? So people are boarding the plane and Rain and I are having this discussion as people are walking by. Some of them recognized me, more recognized him. And it was a weird thing, right? And um, and we knew we were going to Sudan. And he said, look, it's not going to work because they don't want what you can do. He said, but if it does work, if you somehow do it, You'll have pulled the sword from the stone and you'll have pulled something that nobody else could do. He goes, it would be fucking cool. And I looked at him and I thought, yeah, you're right. So I texted my manager and I said, let's quit much music. Let's go to CBC. I hit send. I turned my phone off and I flew 
to Darfur. Fuck yeah. In the middle of my trip in Sudan with the war going on, I get on a satellite phone and I call him, right? And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, totally. Let's fucking do it. And he's like, awesome. And that's how it happened. <laughs> how it oh happened. my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So you have this show for a decade. Again, like the arts, the culture, the politics, you really were the heartbeat for Canada to know what was going on, what we need to be aware of. What are some of the key moments that really stand out to you? Like some of your favorite interviews? I mean, shit, who haven't you interviewed? I've been so lucky to interview most of the people I loved. Um, you know, the highlights for me are getting to experience, because it's kind of like what you and I are doing here, that when two human beings meet each other at their presence and just all the bullshit, all the artifice of being in front of a camera or lights, when two human beings just connect and they look at each other and say, all right, let's do this. Yeah. Like, let's really fucking do this. You want to go? Let's go. That that I've had a few of those moments where I remember in like June Callwood, I got to interview June Callwood, this great activist, a few, a few maybe a week before she passed away. Oh. We knew she was going to pass away. She was terminally ill. And it was about that. Two people just at their rawest talking. I remember I had to interview Ed Norton once and I was sitting down to interview him. And he was preoccupied on his Blackberry at the time. He 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 was doing a junket. He had no time for another interview. And and I get it. I get it. I'm sitting there. So I ask him a question, a generic question to start. He gives me a bullshit answer, which is fair because it was a bullshit question. It was a <laughs> it was a standard bullshit question. It was a standard bullshit answer. It was he met me at my presence. Cool. But I had a moment where I thought, nah, no, nah, I'm not doing this. So I said, I asked him a second question that was not any of this. And he had barely looked at me to start the, the interview. And then he went to answer the question in autopilot. Then he paused and he looked at me and went, okay. <laughs> he at, and he put his phone down. He's like, that, yeah, let's do this. And then we dove in. And those were the moments that I loved when, where I'm not trying to get over. I'm not trying to, I don't need to make myself look good. I already have the show. That's the, the presence alone is the win, right? You, yeah. you don't have to, it's not about me. And I think what I, I adopted with, with him and with others is it's not even about you. It's actually about this experience so that somebody who's had a terrible day, who was trying to hide their tears on the streetcar when they were going home on Queen Street on the 501 and they just ate this fucking shitty piece of leftovers and they put the TV on tonight and their problems are compounded and profound and they got these two guys on tv who are clearly very privileged regardless of how we got here if we do this interview and we make it about us bro we fucking failed this is about keeping her company this is about letting somebody go to bed maybe knowing a little bit more than when they woke up but also feeling a little bit more getting a little bit more permission to push themselves like that's what it was so i started to do interviews like that and when I started to do interviews like that, I, I, I felt like it clicked. You and then unlocked a bunch of another level. Did, yeah, people who didn't like me, there when, when I got the job at CBC, so CBC had announced there was a new show and a whole bunch of people applied to be producers. Then CBC announced it was me. Half the people withdrew their applications, right? From CBC internally. But a whole group of people who would never have applied suddenly applied and it was it was that june callwood interview and a couple of those old school ones where where the people who didn't think the show was for them realized that we were for them we were for 16 year olds and 85 year olds we were for 40 year olds because we weren't for an age group what we were for is an experience and, yeah. and 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 a life we're here for a life lived and that's when it changed for me at cbc and I, and i felt like June call with Michael J. Fox talking about what he was battling. Mm -hmm. Things like that became really, really impactful. I had such a great time, especially the first handful of years there where, where it was still so pure. Right? It was something. <laughs> those, those good glory years when you can just like be in it, no other BS. Like you guys just like had such a great stride. And for me to be able to watch that show and watch your career and watch the way that you've really handled yourself. And again, coming back to just staying true to yourself. I have always been such a huge fan of yours. Um, so I really appreciate you jumping on here with me. I feel like it's funny starting this interview and I was legit 
like nervous. I was nervous, like psyching myself out for the interview of thinking like, oh my God, what, like, what could I possibly ask? I mean, there's a million things I could ask you, but like to really hone in and have a great interview with you. But honestly, my big takeaway is I just, I feel like, I feel like you filled my cup up during this interview. So I feel really, I just feel happy after interviewing you. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me and let me be part of this. You know, that old cliche that people tell you, um, and it sounds like they're talking bullshit, but it's real, which is the only thing that matters is how people feel when they leave the room with you. Like when that, how, how do people feel around you? That's kind of the only thing that matters. And so I, yeah. I, I strive to surround myself with people who challenge me and push me and do things and talk to you. And I was so thrilled for your career. Um, people who are interesting and interested and want to bring people together. This is, this is the key. Like we're so lucky to fucking do what we like. Honestly, look at the hard work that people do. I used to drive a forklift and unload air. Like, I don't want to fucking do that. That's yeah. shit that I don't have the energy to do anymore. <laughs> what a <laughs> gift to be able to do what we love for a living. So I know. it's gotta be about this. It's gotta be about real human connection. 100%. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy doing a million different things, but uh, keep that grind going.